Welcome to the Work Done Right podcast, where we talk with industry professionals to discuss best practices in construction, manufacturing, and maintenance. I am your host, Wes Edmiston, Director of Product with Cumulus Digital Systems and 15-year construction industry veteran. Today's episode is from a conversation that I had with Chris Nixon, which originally aired on his podcast, The Dirty Boots Show. Throughout the episode, we touch on many important factors for success in construction, both for your project and for your personal career. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And if you're not already a listener, make sure to go over to the Dirty Boots Show and check it out. Now, on to the show. Hey, everyone. Chris Nixon here with uh, the Dirty Boots Show, one of the co-hosts. I'm pretty damn excited today to, to get uh, Wes on the show. And I know he... Uh, he also hosts a podcast, Worked on Right, but we'll get to that in, in a second here. Wes, how are you doing? I'm great, Chris. How are you? Things are good, man. Um, so give us a little bit of the lay of the land. Like, who is Wes? Like, you know, why, why are we talking today? Uh, who am I? There's, there are a lot of different hats that I wear at any one time. But uh, as, as I say in the introduction of the, the Worked on Right podcast, I am a construction industry veteran. I spent about 15 years in the industry, and now I'm the director of product and industry strategy at Cumulus Digital Systems, uh, a technologies and innovations company, much much like a sign R, right? Uh, so yeah, that's that's me. I I started off actually to go way far back when I was in fifth grade. The town that I lived in here in the Midwest got blown down by a tornado, and. Uh, so all of like sixth grade and seventh grade, I was helping my stepdad to rebuild houses. And that's where I really first cut my teeth in, in all things construction. Were you, were you there? Yeah, I was, I was in the basement. Yeah. So the, the side of town that I lived on, everything was great. This little town of 850 people. Uh, yeah, everything on the Eastern side of the railroad tracks was pretty much just leveled, but but no, so so fortunately, uh, you know, there uh, to my recollection, there weren't any any fatalities, no casualties or anything. It was just a lot of a lot of destruction, and and really, you know, again, kind of a, a good opportunity, if anything, to look for the silver lining, a good opportunity to start learning the basics of construction, uh, as I used to say all the time. Kind of whenever you learn how to read a tape measure, what plumb level square is, and you can you can apply that to just about anything. Uh, then when I was in high school, I started, uh, I was working in a restaurant and I had to pick up a second job. It's a very long story. Uh, but I started working in a fabrication facility as well. And I would do anything and everything that needed to be done and just started learning as much as I could. Did you like it? I mean, I, it's, it's work. I was also going to school full time. I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. Again, that's a very long story. Uh, but uh, no, so eventually I ended up dropping out of college and I had a friend of mine, uh, he was going to be going to Texas to start building offshore oil platforms. And he asked if I was interested in going with him. So I took him up on the job and I went down there. Why'd you say yes? Sorry to, sorry to interrupt you. Why'd you say yes? There was a lot of personal reasons that were going with it, but yeah, it was, you know, there were, there were some turbulent times going on in my life uh, to kind of cover that uh, and just glance over it. But also, geez, I was already working 70 or 80 hours a week, and I was just kind of spinning my wheels. And it seemed like a great opportunity, right? It was, it was a big gamble at the same time. I had never really left the Midwest too much. But, uh, yeah, it, it just kind of seemed like the right thing at the right time to do. And I went down there. And started building offshore oil platforms. I was a, was a pipe fitter and just kind of kept through that. It was always actually, to be honest, it was always a plan that I had to to do that long enough to where I could start getting a little bit ahead and end up going back to school. That was always my plan. And somewhere along the way, I started very much enjoying what I was doing. I uh, I had I had. I like talking with everybody. I like learning everything that I can from anybody and everybody that I can. Uh, so, so while I was a pipe fitter, whenever I'd finish up a job in one area, I would go over and I would I would learn from the structural guys. I would learn from the 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 the, the, the coatings guys, the painters, uh, the insulators, the, the guys doing architectural work. Anything and everything that I could learn, I was there just trying to soak up as much as I could, and uh, ended up got promoted to foreman actually pretty quickly. I did quite well. Uh, and then, you know, just 
kept building on that momentum, uh, went to a couple of other projects, built some some natural gas facilities, built uh, carbon capture facilities, and um, held other roles along the way, sometimes going back onto my tools, sometimes working up to general foreman. And on a couple of projects, I, went, I worked on a couple of different shell projects, uh, working for contractors and subcontractors. And the shell reps that would walk around the project, I always, you know, whenever I was 21 years old, I made up my mind that that's, that's what I want to do. I want to be one of those guys. I, th- I thought that they, I mean, they were always one kind of curmudgeon and, and difficult to, to deal with sometimes, but also they're just, I mean, they were, they were very capable people and, and I always learned a lot from them. And, uh, I was working a project and I, at this point I, I had already been, like I said, foreman, general foreman. I, I got my CWI along the way. Also I'm a certified welding inspector and I was leaving a project. We finished up our scope and it was a shell project again. And as I was leaving, one of the inspectors was, was coming in from lunch uh, I think he used to take quite long lunches because this was this was well after when he should have been back. Uh, and he'll listen to this show and he'll know who I'm talking about. But uh, uh, he asked me, where are you going? So I'm, I'm going home. I, I uh, actually you know, probably end up going at this time. I was in central Texas, probably go to Houston. A buddy of mine wanted me to go be a superintendent for him. And he said, no, you're not. He said, send me your resume and... Uh, about a month later, I was I was working for Shell. I was an inspector for Shell, and uh, just kind of started down that path. Uh, I was doing inspection for for piping and welding and all of that fun stuff. Uh, ended up after about six months, I became a lead inspector, and then after about nine months, started doing completions management for them. Went to another project, uh, polyethylene facility in Pennsylvania. Uh, ended up rather large project, about $15 billion project. And there I was, I was the, the senior inspector. I had domain over all things, uh, piping, mechanical, civil, structural, uh, a lot of the, the insulations and coatings and, and really just about, just about anything other than electrical. That's that, that's the one thing that I just, I haven't figured out still. I, I watch YouTube videos on my Saturday mornings and I still just can't, I, I have a mental block, but, uh, and I also, my construction director on that project, I had worked for him before in the past. He, I, I was, so I was also dual, dual hatted. He ended up after COVID asked me to report to him, uh, in various capacities. So I was doing project management for him over all of our, uh, the commercial buildings that were being built on site and off of the, the cogeneration facility, three on two combined cycle power plant, while also doing all of my, uh, inspection duties and all of that stuff elsewhere. Kind of along the way to, to tie it up how I ended up in the role where I am now. Uh, Cumulus, we, we have a product called Smart Torque, the Smart Torque system, where we interface with Bluetooth tools to the mobile application. And uh, I met them, the, this team, on my first project uh, working for Shell. They, they were actually incubated within Shell, within Shell's tech work division. And the product at first, it was it was it was a little bit shaky, just as any beta project is, right? And I had a, I had a project manager come up to me. I was the young guy, and he he had one of the wrenches, you know, a tablet, and he set it down on my desk, and he said, "Make this work," and he just walked away. I said, "All right, <laughs> where <laughs> do we go from here?" Right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So that's how I got introduced to these folks, and uh-huh. along the way, built a, a tremendous relationship with the team. Uh, we have a really a really good group of people here with Cumulus and uh, took them up to the project in Pennsylvania as well, worked with them, really got the product in in an amazing position and expanded it out. And I I left Shell at the beginning of 2022. And whenever I left them, I uh, met our CEO. He he asked again, as he'd been asking for a couple of years, hey, do you want to join our team? And and I, I consented. I obliged. So been here ever since. Cause I, yeah, I think you've what it's been a year, year and a half. Yeah, just, since you joined? just over a year. Yeah, fourteen okay. months ago, joined with joined nice. these folks. When I want to dig into cumulus a little bit before we get there, what would you attribute um, your rise? Like, it sounds like everywhere you've been, like people have wanted you, like and have been recruiting you. And what can you can you can you pin it on something? I mean, I know it's number one thing, right? It's like a series and 
um, of, of things. But what, what do you think may have contributed to that? If I had to say the, the number one thing that has helped me to, to get ahead, to get promoted, would be just a, a general level of, of curiosity and humility. Uh, I, like I said, I, I, I like asking a million different questions, learning everything that I can. And to take that approach, uh, you have to understand that, that you don't know everything. So I think if I had to say the number one thing is just, again, like I said, is, is this idea of, of continuously learning and expanding my knowledge in whatever way I can uh, and just doing what I can to, to help projects along. It's like when, when I was asked uh, to do project management dual-hatted while also having responsibilities over quality, uh, the, the question was raised, well, do you think this is going to be a conflict of interest? Because there were certain areas that that I had, you know, ownership over the quality and the the delivery, and uh, and I I told anybody and everybody, and I'll tell everybody this uh, until the day that I die. There's a right and wrong way to build a plant, and we're going to do it the right way. We don't we don't we, I, I will not sacrifice the integrity of the of the the facility for for any reason, uh, and and we're going to do this the right way. So. Uh, if I would say, yeah, again, you know, just kind of the, the number one and number two things, I guess it would be is, is just a general level of curiosity and, and continuous learning and improvement and uh, and just integrity, doing the right thing. Yeah. And, and, I, and I know you mentioned it. I'd also add in that humility part, because uh, so I don't know if, if you've met anyone like this, but sometimes our egos get in the way. Of, uh, of of some of those learnings, right? I know I've been guilty of it. I'm not sure you have, but uh, I've met plenty of people that are. <laughs> I, I 100. percent Yeah, this this isn't to say that I'm I'm the most humble person. Uh, if there were some people that I said this to, they would they would probably bust up laughing because there are areas of my life I can be quite arrogant. But <laughs> but uh, there's a. Uh, we'll Sorry to interrupt you. I wanted to do a, a, a whole different po- podcast episode just on that. So yeah. <laughs> on that topic, <laughs> I'll probably squeeze it in here and there. But there's, there's a quote Good. that I learned whenever I was younger, uh, which is, "Employ your time uh, improving yourself by the works of others, so that you can come easily by what others have labored hard for." So it's it's basically you know read books and ask questions, uh, because other people dedicate their lifetime to learning these bits of information, and if you and especially in the day of the age of, of the internet, uh, it's it's more true than ever that there's so much opportunity to learn, and and yeah that's 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 the biggest part of it for me. It's 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 a heck of a time to be alive, especially considering the internet. Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. You said reading books and, and, and asking questions. So you're, so you're not advocating for watching reality TV and keeping to yourself. That's not your thing. <laughs> no, not in the least. Uh, that's one thing that I just don't do. My wife will watch uh, The Bachelor as a guilty pleasure, but I just, I can't stomach it. <laughs> so we all have our thing. You know, for me, it's golf and I have two kids. So, you know, it's how often can I actually play with two? They're a little bit older now, but still, you know, not completely self-sufficient. I'm not sure they ever will be, you know, with that, you know. Um, but so director of product strategy and innovation. So what, and I don't mean to be, to be uh, malicious here at all, but what, like, what the hell does that really mean? Like, you know, <laughs> break it down for us. <laughs> yeah. Uh, very good question. That's the question I had whenever I first joined. Uh, like, What exactly am I supposed to be doing? And if I could say uh, on the the product side of things, I think that kind of speaks for itself a little bit better, right? So we have we have a product line with you know fundamentally we are a SaaS company, software as a service, and the my responsibility is to to control the roadmap and help to drive the product to get to a position where it best serves our customers and any new developments that we have uh, to really. Uh, kind of pioneer what it is, which directions we go, and get the correct level of of customer insights and personal insights to define the products in the best way possible. Again, to be able to best serve our customers. So, uh, as far as the director of product, that's 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 the direction for that. Uh, and the other one, the other title is director of industry strategy. Okay. Yeah, I said I said innovation, but I think I meant industry strategy, and they can be somewhat synonymous. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right. 
Yeah. Uh, and then as far as that goes, it's, it's what I do there is kind of the interaction with the, the is more toward the sales side and the, the our customer success teams. So this is just kind of generally speaking, again, providing that, that we'll say expert customer insight in order to be able to, to help them to best understand our kind of our customer's experience so that whenever they're going through their efforts, whether it is that, that they're calling on a potential new customer or if we're talking about going through the implementation process, whatever it is, it's, it's how do we best you know, position ourselves? How do we best communicate the message uh, to the customer so that they, in, in a way that, that they understand because it's speaking the same language, that, so that, so that our team can be successful. And again, to be able to make our customers best successful. No, that's cool. Um, <clears throat> are you guys, so it's cumulus. Tell, tell us a little, just a, maybe a snippet on, on you like global North America centric, you know, I'm assuming you're growing your customer base. What's that look like? Yeah, so we are a global company. We have an office in KL. Our headquarters is in Boston. We also are setting up an office in Houston. Most of our customers are centralized around you know the Americas, but we do have a large presence in, in Southeast Asia, and we're expanding actually right now into into parts of Europe. Our customers, we actually have a pretty diverse group of customers, anywhere from you know conventionally. Like whenever we started with with industrial oil and gas, right? That's having been started within Shell. That's kind of the the logical, uh, you know, main focus for our customer base. But we also are are heavy into the the data center industry as well as expanding out into some other, uh, you know, we'll say industrial slash more commercial uh, construction and other things like transport with with rail and, and other forms of uh, preventative and, and recurrent maintenance. Our product is, it, we'll say it's a connected worker platform. So again, we interface with with some Bluetooth tools and other technologies in order to to set values and record values, capture information throughout the completion of work activities. Uh, again, our flagship product is the smart to work system that was the first product we came out with where a work it the our mobile application guides a worker through completing bolting up a flange connection doing all of the inspection for that making sure that they have the right uh, materials put in for that and then guiding them through the process of tightening a connection to assure that the connection upon startup and during operations is leak free. And from all of the data that we've aggregated through the process, and even we published a paper at Gas Tech last year, that, that it works. Uh, we're, we're about 100 times less. Uh, we have about 100 times less leaks than compared to conventional means where people are just kind of going through the process and, and, and in a lot of forms guessing as far as what they're supposed to be doing. But at the backbone of our of our product is what is called the cumulus workflow. So this is where you're able to take an existing procedure effectively and slice that into steps. Because the thing that we recognized is that uh, effectively every activity in construction can be broken down into a step by step by step activity, and. What we do is we input various levels of, we'll say, checklist questions and photos and all that stuff uh, in order to guide the worker through completing the activity, whether we're talking about uh, a concrete uh, pour where they're going to go through and set up forms and tie rebar and, and you know, do slump tests and whatever else they're going to be doing, or whether we're talking about, about going through the coatings process and you know, uh, abrading the surface and, and applying whichever level of, of however many coats of the various processes and, and coating systems that they're doing, whatever it is. Uh, we guide them through completing that, but also the thing that, that I found most valuable about this valuable about the system when when deploying it on my projects was that it also provides the uh, like a snapshot of the just-in-time information that the folks need to actually be able to complete the work. 
So as a fitter, as a foreman, I can't tell you how many times I've had, I've been walking around projects, looking for the right person, calling somebody on the radio, whatever it is, just trying to get the right information. What am I supposed to do right here? I think there's a, there's a stat from Autodesk that says about 35% of worker time goes to, to wasted activities, non-productive activities, I think is what they call it, where uh, they're looking for drawings, they're performing rework, they're just they're just not contributing to the real end goal of the project. And it's, it's, it's no fault of theirs, right? They, they're trying to get things done. They just don't have the right information. So that's where a product like ours is, in my opinion, great because we're able to just provide that information exactly what they need and, and also how to do it in a big way to, to help keep people productive so we're not, you know, bringing in robots in order to to take over somebody's job. We're just really helping somebody to be able to do it in a lot more efficient and effective manner. No, that's cool. And if you guys ever um, are looking to to crack the Australia New Zealand market, that's where we were actually a signer was founded. Our CEO and co-founders um, from Australia. We have about two thirds of our customers are in Australia New Zealand. Um, and funny enough, you said rail and um, the way. And not to go too far off track here about a signer, but. The way that a signer was founded was um, our CEO owned a, like basically a rail services and maintenance company in you know in Sydney, and um, was out in the market looking for like hey I need software to run operations like scheduling a crew, tracking their time, getting feedback from the field, right? And uh, and a lot for like more subcontractors, but um, couldn't find anything, and then created a signer, and then you know eight ish years later here we are. So anyway, if you want any. Uh, Tips on that market. I know you said Europe and and, and APA, or Asia, but um, it could be an <clears throat> excuse me interesting conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'd definitely be interested. I've I've talked with a few folks. The the project that I worked in Pennsylvania, uh, the contractors organization had a massive presence fr- of people from Australia, and so I, I worked with a whole bunch of folks from Australia. A bunch of really good people, uh, but yeah, and and I've talked with a couple of them since that have gone back to Australia, but haven't had any luck yet. I'd absolutely be happy in order to to have a conversation about what we can do in order to to kind of crack that egg. Yeah, no, that'd be great. And Work if there's anything we can right. do to help with Einar, that's great. No, I, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, I think that'd be awesome. So, work, tell me about work done right. You're, I know you've you said. Um, as of this recording, you just released your fifth episode. You got a slew of, uh, episodes in the, in the, in the backlog or the hopper. Um, tell us a little bit about that and what you've learned. Uh, yeah. So the, the show is, I mean, it's, it's really very similar to this, right? It's all about just talking to, to industry professionals and putting out useful information. I, like I said, whenever I was coming up through the ranks and even whenever I was at, you know, my highest positions, I've, I've always just loved talking to anybody and everybody and figuring out more of what we can do better on, on, on projects or in our personal lives, right? Talking about people about their finances and it's just honestly anything and everything. Uh, cause this is, to me, this is how we all get better, right? Is we share information. We don't, we don't hold this in and, um, we just, we just kind of learn from everybody that we can. So the the mission of the show is to talk with with you know industry experts from manufacturing, construction, maintenance to you know kind of tackle the issues that we all know are on projects uh, or in an operating facility, right? Uh, and and try to help answer some of the questions that we all have. Uh, there's also a big aspect where you know I think everybody is is understanding that there's there's going to soon be a skilled management gap, and uh, this is also a great way in order to put out useful information to people that are getting into leadership positions or to getting into to you know they're they're a safety person on the project for the first time and I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing or how can I do better. It's just really a great way in order to put out information from. Some people that that I've worked with in the past, uh, some of these people that I've just kind of been fortunate enough to meet in my roles with Cumulus, or just because they're they're interested in sharing their story on a podcast. Uh, so that's that's again like kind of the mission of the show, and you know, I guess things that I've learned since starting the podcast. One, 
that these folks that are able to go out there and do like a three and a half hour show, uh, <laughs> they must have the best stamina in the world. That is, it is taxing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, right. uh, I've had, I've had days whenever I recorded and, and, and I'm sure you've had the same where you've, where you record multiple episodes in the same day. I think the most that we've done is, is three in a day and, and I am dead. I mean, I, I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and I would, I would rather train for three hours straight than podcast straight <laughs> it is totally different uh most of your calories are consumed by the brain right so it, it kind of just shows the significance of it but uh yeah no so other other than just the general uh the general nature of how how intense it actually is to to go through the process of having these conversations uh you know i was actually i was talking on another show here recently we were we were interviewing some folks and they had brought up uh it was it was some folks that actually have their own podcast as well called the the site visit and and they were talking about how the, one of them was saying that he'll go back and he'll listen to his old recordings as as a way of you know kind of sharpening his skills but also trying to make sure that he's extracting all of the information that he can and i got to say i i can't agree enough with just it's amazing how you can be engaged in the conversation and then hear it again later. And there's just, you know, incredible sound bites that are just like, I, I just I, either I didn't pick up on that during the conversation or uh, just this, I was saying it to them the other day that one of the folks that I, I interviewed here recently, it was our, our fourth episode that we released, a gentleman by the name of Bobby LaBeouf. I worked with Bobby six years, seven years. I've known him for, for quite a while now. And in the 35 minutes that I talked to Bobby after again, working with him for years, he was somebody that helped to mentor me whenever I was working within shell. I'm still learning more from Bobby, right? Just, just the general nature of, uh, you know, how it is that he conducts work whenever he's, he's now the, uh, uh, the director of HSSE for, for a large oil and gas company, you know, the the methodology that he uses in executing his job and also how it is that he mentors people it's just like god i out of out of all the conversations we've had we've talked for for days i'm still learning more so i think i think the the message with all of that is is i mean kind of re- this recurrent message of you can always learn something from from everybody even the people that you think that you've learned everything you can god there's so much more out there that you can learn like it's it's yeah, it's it's a big passion of mine, and I'm fortunate enough to to host the show because there's there's great information out there. One gentleman, for instance, uh, by the name of Jeff Smithills. This was the first episode that we released. Uh, he was saying, and this was just a staggering number, saying that there was an estimate done by I think McKinsey that in order to reach uh, our our goals for net zero by you know, 2030 or 2050 or whatever it is, we need to spend globally something in the order of magnitude of like $5 trillion per year in projects. $5 trillion per year. Largest project I've ever been on ended up being, we'll say somewhere in the ballpark of $15 billion. And that took four and a half years. Right, right. You know, I, we had skilled labor shortages there. We had issues in Granite. It, it came through the pandemic, so that that definitely had an impact on us. But five trillion dollars per year. Uh, what are we going to do, right? How do we end up refining our processes to where we can actually deliver this? And it so just even thinking about uh, about stats like that. You know, I I never would have learned this if it wasn't for talking with Jeff. So I'm very appreciative of being able to host the show and learn information like this. Uh, talking with another lady, uh, uh, Jennifer Wilkerson from the National Center for Construction Education and Research, you know, is is telling me all about uh, how it is that that they approach the situation with getting more people into the skilled trades. Uh, kind of the origins of where all of this comes from, from uh, the, the, whenever the, what was it? Whenever the GI bill was introduced, people started just kind of seeing 
university is the way to go and people stopped going to the skilled trades as much and that led to the situation where we have it now and uh, also just some of the net benefits that that crews see from from bringing in women and having women into the trades just you know kind of slicing this in a whole bunch of different ways uh i guess to answer the question directly is you know what what all have i learned from from hosting a podcast i've learned a lot <laughs> i thought i already knew quite a bit but i'm still learning so much. I, I, I love it. I really do. No, it's interesting you said that because um, <clears throat> the last episode we just released um, on the Dirty Boots show was the Colorado president of women in asphalt. And it was just fascinating to hear her perspective. She comes from industry. It's obviously a woman in the industry and just the, her perspective on that dynamic and working and how it's changed or how it's not over time. Um, and it's just, yeah, well, I was going to ask, you brought up labor shortage a couple of times. I know we talk about it ad nauseum, or it seems like it's it's all we talk about. But <clears throat> um, it's interesting. Our very first ep- episode was with a, actually a customer of ours. His name is Ricky Glass. Um, and he talked a lot. And he's a he's a military vet. But he talks, talked a lot about that path from, like, everyone, like, this prescribed, you have to go to university, you have to, you know, and then all the enormous amounts of debt that sometimes come associated with that. Um, and kind of the dearth of people going a different path or a different route. Right. So I was going to ask you what your silver bullet fix was to the labor shortage, but I don't know. Maybe I don't know if you have one or not. Yeah. Uh, the silver bullet fix. I, I don't know about all of that. Actually, I listened to that episode. It was a really good episode. Uh, he had a really interesting perspective as far as, you know, getting you know, the, the value that, that veterans bring to uh, to the industry. I was, it was really good to listen to. But, you know, is there a silver bullet? I think about about my story and about my perspective, how it is that I got into the industry. And, and, you know, it was, it was very much again, kind of uh, begrudgingly in a way that I got into the industry. I, I never expected this to go the way that it did. And I am, I am thankful and appreciative that it did, but, uh, cause I, I, I've met so many amazing people and done so many great things that I, I never, I never possibly could have imagined. Uh, but it's, I think it's really just around the idea of changing people's perspective on what it is to get into the construction industry. People really view this as, as I'll say it lesser than getting a college degree. I, I, I have a degree. I said right back here. I, I finished that up last year and I can tell you that I learned a lot more on projects than I ever did in university. Uh, it's, it's, it's not even, uh, yeah, it's, people think about it as, as kind of a lowbrow sort of thing to do is get into the construction industry, and that is the furthest thing from the truth. So I think that changing people's perspective on what it means to be a construction professional, I think that's a big part of it. You know, I think that one of the other things, though, in the space of the labor shortage that we could do, it's not, it's not you know, how do we just get more people in it's how do we use the people we have more efficiently? That's something that, and I know there are a lot of companies out there that are trying to do, trying to solve this problem, trying to improve it in some means. But one of the things that I've noticed, and I was actually talking with uh, my old construction director just earlier today, and he was bringing it up. Uh, so I won't even take all the credit for for this this portion of the conversation. This all goes to Wayne. But you know, a lot of companies do a good job of helping projects to be more efficient but a lot of comp- a lot of companies are really focused on you know serving the project manager or su- serving the superintendent and you know you know he said it Wayne said it earlier today I've I've said it for a long time throughout my career I am biased I think that the person that you really need to be targeting is your foreman and how we can better enable foremen in order to better manage their people because again if 35% of our time is going toward toward non-productive activities. Well, that seems like a really big opportunity in and of itself. Because if you don't think about this as, uh, I guess if you think about this in a different perspective of what would happen if we brought 35% more people on project? Would that solve our problem? Because that's, you know, solving the labor shortage, that's largely what it is that we're saying. We need more people. So is 35% more people, is that enough? What if we just help them to be more efficient with the people that they already have? So I think that that's a big part of it for me. And and solving the labor shortage isn't just how do we get more bodies onto sites. I think it's how do we enable those bodies in order to be optimally efficient? 
You know what I mean? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. And I mean, you think about that 35% and this is overly simplistic, but, um, you know, what we hear from our customers, at least our customer base is, you know, revenue perhaps is going up, but margins are going down. Right. So that productivity is a challenge and, and, you know, obviously labor shortage is a challenge, but how do you, I mean, that 35% presents a huge opportunity. I mean, you know, mar, you know, you know where the margins sit and in a lot of the, at least our customer base is um, significantly less than that. And um, if they could just do a little bit, even a little bit more with what they have and, and be more productive, then that could change the game for them. Right. Oh, it's huge. I mean, they, they will, anybody that's able to, to kind of solve that problem of just working more efficiently, those are going to be the really in the next 10 years, they're going to be the general contractor. They're going to be the subcontractor of choice because they're just doing it better than everybody else. Uh, and that's, you know, it's not about how do we, how do we attract the most people to me? It's, it's about, again, how it is that we're able to best utilize the people that we already have. And I really think truly that the person that that starts with is, is the foreman. And one of the things about that, that I think is really interesting. And this is something I've thought about since, since I, my Jesus was probably 2000 and 12, uh, is, the foreman, again, I think I think a lot of people can, once you say it, they will agree. Like, yeah, that's it's probably one of the most important people on the project in the sense that that that's where really where the rubber meets the road. That's your your first level of supervision. Those are the folks that help to set the attitude of all of the craft on the job. They're the ones that plan the day in, day out activities. They're responsible for for helping to get materials and people and and Anything and everything done, right? They're the ones coordinating at the ground level. They're they're doing really it all. But most of them don't really get any training. And that is just that just blows my mind. Whenever I first became a foreman, really, honestly, one company uh, I worked for, I worked for five different companies as as either a foreman or general foreman. And one company on one project gave me training. And this was after I'd already been doing it for five years. Uh, so that, that alone I think is just, is odd. And this, this isn't unique either to, to open shop or union. Whenever I was, whenever I was in Pennsylvania on that, on the pen chem project, I was talking with a, uh, one of the, one of the boilermaker foremen and great guy, uh, really uh, very knowledgeable. And, and I had noticed that he was gone for a couple of days. So I'm talking to him one morning. I'm like, "Hey, where you been?" He says, "Oh, well, I I went and and took a training, you know, a, a frontline supervisor training through through the hall." I'm like, "Oh, that's great." He said, "Yeah, I wasn't going to do it because they for for supervisors, the site will not cover the hours for frontline supervisor training. They'll cover it, you know, for 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 the the personal development for the craft labor." But they wouldn't cover it for the supervisors, and and I went to uh, the the area construction manager, and I said, "Listen, we have to change this. These are the people that that make it happen day in and day out. Why would we not invest in these people and enable them to to improve themselves? If they want to do better, then we need to reward that sort of mentality. And and we had a shift on project, and we we there were some. There was some uh, kind of political aspect to it, but but we ended up ultimately implementing a change and and enabled them in order to go to trainings and still effectively be compensated through the project to do so. It, but the fact that we have to have that conversation to enable this to occur is just is just bizarre to me. So I think that one of the areas that that we can make a significant improvement in the industry is investing in our frontline leadership helping to to train them up whether it's it's you know dedicating a portion of our time whenever we're deploying technologies like like Asinar's technologies or or on cumulus in cubus's front we can you know dedicating time to to serving them specifically but also you know our, our contractors going out there and 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 really giving them resources to understand how they can better plan how they can better manage uh, I think it's it's a huge opportunity. No, it's absolutely fascinating. And it, it sounds like that's even a whole 
potential podcast episode as well, just about, <clears throat> you know, that, that particular topic. But well, Wes, I, I really wanted to not to cut it, cut this short cause we could talk for hours or days. It, it sounds like, but, uh, really appreciate you being on the dirty boot show. And I know you're going to do some stuff with this on, on work done right. But, uh, thanks Wes. Chris, thank you for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. I uh, hope we can do this again sometime. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this episode of the Work Done Right podcast. Please help us out by subscribing and leaving us a review. And as always, our show notes are linked in this episode's description. Thank you for listening and see you next time.